And this message, this passage, is probably, if I look back at the, all the years I've been preaching, I have probably preached on this passage more than any passage I've ever preached. And there's a reason for that. One is, I love the passage, and it just happens to be that we're studying the book of James now, going through it verse by verse. But there's another reason, which is because I believe it is one of the greatest battles that Christians in the modern era face, is how to tame our tongue, how to control our mouths. And, and I think it's an incredibly important text and one that we really need to understand, one that we really need to embrace, and one that we really need to bring change about in our lives. And so we're going to look at this passage, James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, and I think there's a lot of rich stuff that we can get out of this. So let's pray and we're going to get right to it. Father God, I'm thankful again for the opportunity that we have to join here in this building, in this facility, and to worship you and to honor you. Lord, I pray that you would um, just show us the people that you've placed in our lives so that we might be able to reach out to them with your gospel truth if they don't know you, with uh, the offer for fellowship if they do know you and just are unchurched, Lord, with the opportunity to join us in the work that you're doing in our lives, Lord, and in this body. And I pray that you would just grow the journey both both internally and externally, and that you would allow us, Lord, to just be used of you as agents of grace in this world that so desperately needs you. Lord, I pray that you would also minister to our hearts tonight, that you would speak into each one of our lives, and I pray, Lord, that whatever the work is that needs to be done, that through your Holy Spirit, you would do it tonight in our presence and work powerfully. In Jesus' name, amen. With great responsibility, the first section, with great responsibility, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. Now, this is a passage that for many years as I've read and as I've looked at it, there's been a little bit of uncertainty in my mind's eye about what this is saying, what it's not saying. And this past few weeks looking into this passage, I think it really is very clear. Not many of you should become teachers. The audience is a predominantly Jewish audience that James had. And in that culture, teachers were viewed as prominent and elevated up on a ladder higher than other people in a very wrong way, actually. There was a lot of prestige, a lot of notoriety that came with people being teachers in that culture. And people sought after it with wrong motivations often. Now, I don't know that that really differs a whole lot from today. People still seek after positions that they believe are prominent or special or important, and oftentimes it's pursued with the wrong motivation. And it occurs. And it occurs in Christianity today, where people venture into this with the wrong motivation. Not many of you should become teachers, and here's a key, my brothers. Now the audience was not only male. The audience was male and female. However, because that word teacher is specifically talking about an office, a role, the role of elder is the role that's being spoken of here, it is a male role, and that is an unpopular statement in our culture today. It just is. But it doesn't change the fact that there is a masculine word used for the word brothers, and it is clearly a role that was given to males. Now, we confuse in our culture roles with value. And we really do it within the church. And that is why there has been such a strong push for female pastors, for female elders, because we're confused that role differs from value. We are all valuable before a holy God. We just have different roles to fulfill. And the role of elder, which is a teaching role, one must be able to teach, it says in the book of Timothy, the description and the qualifications are given in Timothy and Titus, and they are both masculine in nature. You must be the head of your household. You must manage your family well. All roles that are given to men. And here, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. A role that was given to males, but males who had been called to this role. And that's very important. For you know, and here's not why many, here's the reason why not many should want this task or claim this task, because we know, or rather, for you know that we who teach 
will be judged with greater strictness. So those who take on this call, those who take on this office, shouldn't shy away from it if God has indeed called, but should understand the seriousness of it. This scripture has been a scripture that has driven my life for over 20 years because I don't want to have to answer for teaching something wrongly. I don't want to have to answer knowing that there's a stricter judgment that I haven't done my due diligence to understand whatever it is that is being taught. And I know that Dave and Mark approach the scriptures in the very same manner because this is a serious warning. One should be slow to become a teacher because of the understanding of the accountability that comes with it and you should know without a doubt that God is calling you into that role. There is without a doubt in my mind a calling that accompanies one who is called to teach. And this supposed prominence, and I say supposed, because in the reality of scriptures, a pastor, teacher, elder is just one role in the concept of the whole church. That's all it is. It's not a more important role. It's just a different role than others have. But it's a role that comes with a strict judgment that you must understand. But this supposed prominence of being a teacher needs to be balanced out with the accountability that comes with it and the seriousness of that. And so, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Here's what was going on back in that day in biblical times. Look at 1 Timothy 1, verses 6 through 7, because I think it exposes the reality of what went on then and what goes on today. Certain persons, by swerving from these, these doctrinal truths, have wandered into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law, and here's the key, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. That doesn't fit very well with the fact that you're going to have a stricter accountability, a stricter judgment. You can't just follow the old adage of if people aren't following you, if you don't think they're understanding, just say it louder. It doesn't work. You'll just be loud and sincerely wrong. That's all you'll be. And so the concept is one we must take this seriously. It is not for some prominence or some special favor that you think you're going to get. It is a serious call with a serious responsibility and it must be entered into slowly but yet confidently once you know that that is what God is calling you to. And so we must understand what we say. And we must not assert confidently things that we're uncertain of. We must take the time to be certain. Second point, when small is big. When small is big. And this is where it starts to get interesting. For we all stumble in many ways. And God in his sovereignty had James, before he gets into a specific issue of struggle and sin, make a very clear statement here that we all stumble in many ways. And I believe the importance of this statement, where it's located right before we're going to get into a specific area of sin, keeps the believer humble if we recognize that we all stumble in many ways. And somehow in our mindsets, each one of us has a few sin issues in our mind that we believe are worse than other sins. We may know the reality that all sin will condemn a man. We may know the reality that all sin is awful before a holy God and will separate an individual from a holy God. But if we say certain words right now and watch reactions, and if you monitor your own reaction, you'll quickly recognize that in your mind, even though you may know the truth that I just stated, you still sort of believe that certain sins are worse than others. It's just a reaction that we have. And our culture has forwarded that. Now the scripture is pretty clear that there are differing consequences to sin. No doubt about it. Just read the Old Testament law and see that there's different punishments that were given to different laws that were broken. Look in the New Testament and look at some of the results of certain sins. But at the end of the day, a man will always reap 
what he has sown. And that is the truth of the way that sinful decisions are made. Now, the reality is, is that we all stumble in many ways. And that puts us all in a very humble position when we're viewing someone else's sin if we first understand this. And that means that their sin is no worse than my sin. And it's no worse than your sin. And our culture today has highlighted certain sins. Christianity and different strains of Christianity have highlighted different sins. And one of those sins that are highlighted today is the sin of homosexuality. Now I'm not afraid, even though this is being recorded, to state that the scripture clearly states that homosexuality is sin. There's no doubt about it. It says it. Can't deny it. Over and over and over again. But is it any more of a grievous sin in the big picture of the fact that all sin separates us from a holy God than a couple who is not wed engaging in sexual activity? Is that not equally sinful? And we need to understand that. But it works in our culture that we highlight these certain sins. Who has ever heard a message on gluttony? The scripture calls it sinful. Why is that not the highlighted sin of life and culture? And is it any worse than lying? Or is it any worse than any other sin that we can find in the scriptures? Again, different consequences. You need to understand that. But our culture highlights certain things and our churches highlight certain things. And really, it's us being prideful because we think that that is worse than the sin that we commit, whether it's outwardly active or just within our own heart. And we must guard ourselves, and that's why I think this is here, for we all stumble in many ways. Before we're going to talk about one big stumbling area, we all stumble in many ways. You know, it's interesting, on Facebook the other day I saw a friend of mine who's a practicing homosexual, and he's a friend of mine. Graduated a couple years ahead of me in high school, and he put a post and kind of went on a, a, just a, I don't know, just on a rant. Because, again, some baker back east what, had a cake that they were baking for a homosexual cover, cu uh, couple, and they wanted to put on the cake some kind of a statement of support of homosexuality, and he wouldn't do it. This baker chose and said, I'm not, I'm not going to put that on your cake. And he goes on this big tirade about how awful that is and, you know, that's discrimination. And, that's, and I, I just wrote to him, it was on a public thing, and I said, first of all, I'm not going to make any opinions on here about homosexuality and my viewpoint of it because this is not the proper format for that. Not right. I was kind of hoping somebody would jump in and say something actually about it because, of course, the assumption will be because I'm a pastor that that means I'll hate people who live in that lifestyle when the reality is very few people have done the things that Kelly and I have done dealing with people who are in that very struggle. And I don't say that in an arrogant way, but we gave up a year of our life to live with 12 guys who were practicing that lifestyle. Not a whole lot of people can say that. So, yes, it's sinful. Yes, I will say that. But Michael, my friend, who was making this statement, went on to say how awful it is and how d discrimination is always towards those who are in a gay lifestyle, da, da, da. So I just went on to say, remember the signs that used to say, no shirt, no shoes, no service? And still are at some places. Is that discrimination? Or is that a business owner's right to make a choice with their business to do whatever they want with their business. And I said, as a business owner and for business owners, I understand that we all make choices and in those choices there are consequences or results that come with them. But it is still that business owner's choice to make a decision to serve whoever they want to serve and to not serve whoever they want to serve. And it's not discrimination, it's their right as a business owner to make any decision they want. Now, would I handle things necessarily like this baker did or like somebody else did? That's irrelevant. The choice is he chose to make a decision based on his personal convictions about his business and there are consequences with it. But we can't hold and say that he has to serve anyone. It's his business. But you see what was being done there is that's a sensitive issue to my friend. And because it's a sensitive issue to my friend, he went on to assume that that is a viewpoint of discrimination towards everybody and this guy must hate those who practice homosexuality. 
It's a big jump from a guy won't write something on a cake to a guy hates everybody who's in a lifestyle of this choice. Big jump. Big assumption there. But we as Christians do the same thing. We kind of get on our little high horses and think that we're better than other people and people who are participate in whatever our pet peeve sin is, we just think that that's the most awful thing in the world. And that's a long way around to get to the point that we all stumble in many ways. We do. And because we start at that point, we should humbly approach any issue of sin in anyone else's life. Understand that. It's the start point. Proverbs 20 and verse 9 says, Who can say I've made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. None of us can. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Again, we all stumble in many ways. 1 John 1 and verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We all stumble in many ways. And then we get to verse 2 of our main text. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Now, I used to get a bit discouraged when I'd read this text and say, well, what's the point then? Obviously, we're all going to stumble, so why worry about it? Well, that's really a misread of what's going on here. This is actually a great encouragement. The mature who learn to control their tongue should be greatly encouraged that they're going to be able to control most things going on in their life when it comes to a battle with sin. If anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, that means we all got a battle going on with the tongue. He's a perfect man. Are we not to aim for perfection? We know we fall short of it, but that doesn't change the aiming point. That doesn't change that that's the goal. And if we can aim at that in the area of our tongue, we will be able to also bridle his whole body. This is an encouragement for the mature. If we evaluate our maturity based on our tongue, the things we say and how we say them and what we say and who we say them to, if we evaluate that, it will tell us a lot about our personal spiritual maturity. And it also will be an encouragement that if we can get that under control, other things will fall under control probably in an easier manner. There's only two options that exist here when we evaluate this. The first one is be totally silent. Say nothing. But that doesn't really solve the problem because there's still a heart issue in there, even if you're not saying it. So that's not a real option. The second one is through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, learn to control your tongue. That's really the option we're looking at. Remember back in James chapter 1 and verse 6? If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless, meaningless. That's a big evaluation based on just the tongue. So it's a serious matter. And it's one that if we get gut level honest, all of us at some arena of life, some area of life, struggle in some manner with the tongue. It's that serious of a matter. Is there anyone here this evening that can clearly say they have no battle at all with controlling their tongue? Anyone? It's tough, isn't it? But there's victory that can be had as we pursue the Holy Spirit in our lives to lead us to a more mature walk. Look at verse 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. This is a perfect picture of the small controlling the large. It's what it is. That bit, you can turn that horse. You can stop that horse. You can make that horse with that little bit in its mouth do what you want it to do. There's a correlation being made here. If the tongue is controlled, you can learn to control the rest. 
if the tongue is controlled, you're demonstrating maturity and naturally the rest will be following under that same or falling under that same maturity and will grow will move. Look at ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Again, small taking care of the large. And I find encouragement in that. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So what is the point that's being made here? The point that's being made is that although the tongue is a very small muscle, a member of our body, it can have a huge hold or effect on the entire outcome of our lives. Do we not know that to be true? For both positive or negative. How many of you in this room have made statements that you regret to this day in your past? Anyone? How many of you are potentially still held hostage by some of the things that you've said in your past? Still has a great impact on your life today. Now the good news is it doesn't have to because we can seek forgiveness from the Lord. We can seek forgiveness from those we've wronged verbally, the things we've said, and we can be and should be as Christians honestly set free from those things in our past. But also we shouldn't ignore the knowledge that was learned or the wisdom that we gained through recognizing that the tongue can do great damage if it's not bridled, if it's not taken care of. Who here has seen their very lives shaped in a negative manner or in a negative area of life because of a lack of control of the tongue? It is a real battle. These are real occurrences. But then who wants to put a stop to any future negative actions that come because of our tongues and a lack of control? And that's really where we need to focus. We cannot change the occurrences of the past. We can go back and make them right. We can take care of business. We can let the Lord set us free from that past because He already has. We just need to embrace that freedom. We don't need to stay and remain guilt-ridden over the things we've done. We just need to make them right. But we can change what happens in the future through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, through righteous living, through choices of wisdom, we can learn to walk in maturity in this area of the tongue. But it's difficult. So let's break it down in our last point tonight. Two opposite directions. The matter is serious. And we need to take it seriously. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Think about that. Entire forests have been totally burned down because of a single spark. Totally done. Buildings have been totally burnt to the ground because of one small spark. We get the picture. It's very clear for us to understand that and to see that. And then it says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The matter is serious. The small tongue, just like a small spark, can do such large and devastating damage and it can leave scars that last forever. That's why we need to be so cautious in how we use our mouths, young and old alike, male and female alike. Doesn't matter where you live in the world or what you do or what your position is or how many um, degrees you have, none of that matters. How do we manage this tongue, this small fire that can do such great damage? You know, there's a couple areas that I go into to hunt and there have been fires that burned there so, so many years ago. And those dead trees are still charcoal scarred. Doesn't go away. Maybe the black lessens a little bit with time from the burn. 
But I still know that there's a fire there. I still know that it was burned. I still know that there was great damage. And it doesn't always go away. And for quick, ill-spoken words, sometimes there is a potential of a relationship being scarred and damaged for life. I know none of us want that. Look at Psalm 120. Deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you? And what more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? A warrior's sharp arrows with glowing coals of a broom tree. A recognition of how damaging the tongue can be and then extreme measures even considered to control it. But we don't need extreme measures to control it. We don't need to burn our tongue or to cut it out. We simply need to fall under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, have an active relationship with Jesus Christ, and grow in maturity and control by choice. The tongue. After all, what is the last word or two words in the long list of fruits of the Holy Spirit? Self-control. Remember, God doesn't call us to anything that he doesn't empower us to do. Self-control is what it is about with the tongue. Proverbs 16, 27. A worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. The tongue is a serious matter. Look at the rest of verse 6. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Folks, this battle is serious. It's really close, knit in our hearts. It's a war that's going on. And we must understand the seriousness of it. First, we're told here, it can corrupt the whole person. It corrupts the whole of our members. It's a source of pollution and defilement for the entire person, for the entirety of the personality. Second, it sets the whole course of his life on fire. And that course means wheel or circle. Our entire circle of life is affected by how we choose to use our tongue. And a misused tongue can affect our future in very negative ways. And third, the tongue itself is set on fire by hell. And this describes Satan's influence and his desire to play in the realm of our language and our conversation in the arena of the tongue. It is serious. In Matthew 15 and 18, it says, But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defies, defiles a person. So how do we control the tongue? I believe we control the tongue way back before we're ready to speak. The mature Christian controls the tongue through being very cognizant of what enters the mind and the heart via the eyes, the ears, and all of life. That's how we control the tongue. Don't think that you can constantly expose your things to things that oppose this truth of this scripture and then you're just going to instantly control the tongue. It doesn't work that way. There's not compartments in our life that we think we can go to work and lie all day here at work in order to get jobs or to do whatever it is we're doing over here and then all of a sudden there's this Christian compartment of our life and that's not going to affect things over here. It doesn't work that way. Don't think that we can expose our eyes and ears to all this filth and defilement and vileness over here and then over here all of a sudden in our family life we're going to treat everybody right and speak right and have no effect from the stuff over there. Don't think just because you keep sin hidden in your closet and nobody knows about it that it doesn't impact and affect every area of your life or my life because it does. And the tongue is an issue of war. It's a battle. And it's serious. Really, James 3, 1 through 6 describes the tongue as it is by nature. By sinful nature. By nature, the tongue could serve to be a divisive instrument of evil, and often is. But by grace, the tongue can become an instrument 
that promotes and brings about blessing. It can become a tool that's used to expose others to the great message of Jesus Christ and to extend grace to all those that enter our life. God can take an abusive tongue and mold it into a force for good and righteousness if we'll submit to the Holy Spirit that indwells us. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. Again, I used to think, huh, it's hopeless. What are we going to do? It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. That's pretty pointed. And it's speaking about your tongue, about my tongue. Not the physical tongue, but the things that it's used to promote and say and do. This just speaks to the constant care that must be given to the guarding of our tongue and the things we say. It's never to just be set free. We're never to just be carefree about our heart because it will show up in the things that come out of our mouth. We must always be guarded because it is in its natural state full of poison. Deadly poison. That is the battle. Romans 3 says this, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. That can never be the description of our lives as Christians. Ephesians 4.29 Pretty pointed scripture. Let no, corrupt, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. You know what that tells me? We're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because of that, we should never have corrupting types of words or conversation come out of our mouth. Our words can be words of grace and we must have great discernment because we can know through that discernment the right things to say in the right circumstance. Again, an apparently negative verse spun to a very encouraging word for each of us this evening. Last three verses, four verses. With it, the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. We just sang praises to Him a little while ago. We pray to Him, which is a form of worship and a practice of worship. We talk to people about Jesus and the one that we love. So with it, the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And sometimes we do it split seconds apart from each other. That's what we're capable of. That's what we can do. That's the battle. That same tongue, we bless God and we curse people who He made. We curse the creation of the Creator while we tell Him how much we love Him. While we tell others how important He is in our lives. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be so. This speaks of the inconsistency in the lives of believers who are not growing and maturing in their walk with the Lord. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce fi figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. You know what this is saying? If the general practice of your life is one of unrighteousness and it shows up in your mouth, you may want to evaluate your walk with God if it's even existent. It's just what it's saying. If the general practice of your life is one of righteous conversation, righteous words, then you're in a right standing with God. It's a verification of that. But you still want to get a hold of those areas where it's not righteous and you still want to get them straight. You still want to mature more. You still want to grow more because you don't want to bring any dishonor to your Lord who saved you. It's a battle. And I want to end 
with one point that's very important about this. Any time that we speak ill of someone else, any time that we want to say something bad about someone else who has offended us or who we think has done us wrong, and we talk to any other individual than that person who did whatever it is that we think they did to us, any time we talk to someone else, we need to understand we've crossed the line of gossip. We need to understand that. And you say, how can you say that? If your brother sins against you, go to him just between the two of you. That's God's standard. Just between the two of you. Anytime we want to go to someone else to talk about someone else, we are crossing a line when it's an area of offense. We don't need a sounding board. You've got the Holy Spirit inside of you. Probably a pretty good sounding board. We don't need to just voice or get someone else's opinion. You're tied into a relationship with the most holy of holy gods. You can get all the input that you need from Him. You've got His holy word at your access all the time. You don't need and don't be deceived into thinking that that's really the reason you're going anyway. Often we go to other people because we want other people to see that person the way we see them. Often we go to other people because we want encouragement that will feed our pride rather than somebody who's going to speak into our life and tell us the right things. Often we go to other people because we're really frustrated and angry and maybe even cross the line to hateful, hatefulness or bitterness and we want that person to feel our wrath rather than letting God take care of them with His wrath. Whatever the reason is we go to someone else, we need to just understand that it's gossip. And it's not controlling the tongue. If you have an issue with someone, the only way you can be right and the only way you can have a right conversation is to go to that individual. That's it. It's that simple. That is a great test of an individual's spiritual maturity. How we handle those kind of areas. It's a great test. And it's important for us to understand. And here's what I know. Everyone in this room will have a tendency because of our sinful nature to want to gossip. Everyone in this room will have that natural tendency. So how do we really control gossip as a body of believers so that we really are different than the rest of the world so that people really can see different loving relationships here? You know how you control it? By the listener. By the listener. If Jonathan comes up to me and says, hey, I'm really having a problem with Steve, I say, stop. Have you talked to Steve about it yet? Nope, then you can't talk to me about it. That's how gossip's controlled. That's how we help each other. Hey, do you know what so-and-so did? No, and I don't want to know. Why don't you go take it up with so-and-so? That's how we control it. Because all of us can slip in a second into the realm of wanting to talk about somebody in an ill manner or a wrong way. So listener, help your brother, help your sister, and put the brakes on. And stop trying to justify wrongful conversation that comes out of your mouth, or in my case, that comes out of my mouth. Let's pray. Father God, I am thankful that again this week, You've been able to give me a reminder of just how important it is to control my own tongue. How easy it is, Lord, to cross that line and to do wrong. To speak ill of those who are your creation. Not only those that are your creation, but if they're in my life, they've been placed there sovereignly by you. How wrong it is, Lord, for myself, for any of us, to not speak rightly of those that you have created, those that you've placed in our life. How wrong it is, Lord, to speak words of corruption or evil or things that are vile in nature and sinful. May we not participate in those kind of conversations. May we truly be a body that only speaks that which is for the edification of the body and that which is to build individuals up. May we guard our tongues, Lord, and may those who are observing our lives recognize a difference in the fact that we don't gossip and cuss and carry on and speak in ways that are dishonoring to you, Lord. May they recognize that about us so that they might ultimately ask why it is that we guard that area of our life. 
and so that we can tell them that you are the source that has enabled us to overcome wrong in that area of our lives. May people be drawn to you, Lord, because of our love one for another, because of the way we manage our relationships with each other, and because of the way that we constantly go out of our way to love and serve one another. May that be clear to those who are looking in so that they too can come to know you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.